Order, order. Welcome to this afternoon's session of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, Susie Allegri and George Ferguson, thank you very much indeed for coming. Um, I'm going to ask Andrew Rossendale to start us off. And as always, if you keep your answers brief and to the point, that would be very gratefully received. And if your uh, other witness has already answered the questions you see fit, d don't feel the need to repeat it. Thank you. Andrew. Um, good afternoon. Uh, can I firstly start by asking a fundamental question? Why do you feel, and the question is to, to both of you, why do you feel that so many former British colonies, um, now known as overseas territories, choose to want to remain part of the British family? Why do they choose to want to stay British when so many others have chosen a different route of independence, but the remaining territories are so determined to keep that link. Why do you think that is? Do you want to start? <laughs> um, I think it, it varies. I think there are as many different reasons as there are overseas territories. I mean, for some of them, it's a kind of question of size where you know, independence would not necessarily be practical. And I think for many of them, though, it's because they feel British. Uh, so it's not a question of, you know, they've never not been British. Um, so there's not a question of, uh, going off and becoming an independent nation, it, it's part of, of their um, sense of self, I suppose, in the same way um, that just because you're Scottish, uh, you, you may still feel very British. Um, so I think for some, there may be practical reasons why independence was never, never thought of, but I think for many it's, a, it's an emotional and, and identity reason. I'd agree with that. I would add also, in a couple of obvious cases, um, security or sovereignty reasons. Uh, and um, although I've only got direct experience of uh, Bermuda and Pitcairn, um, there's an element of if it's not broken, why fix it or change it? Uh, and in some cases, um, which links with the point about size, um, the, the need for assistance financially and materially. So do you feel that the British identity that the overseas territories have, do you feel that's something that is now solid, absolutely permanent, that whatever happens, uh, the, the 16 remaining overseas territories um, feel deeply part of the British family, or do you think it's, it's something that in a, you know, 20, 30, 50 years, 100 years, it will gradually evaporate? Like everything else, I think it varies across the different territories. Uh, some feel a greater sort of organic attachment than others. Uh, for some, I think it's a matter of convenience and not getting around to doing anything about it. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think for some, uh, there may be areas where suddenly it doesn't become expedient to be British anymore. So the feeling of Britishness, I think you probably have to ask people directly from, mm -hmm. from the overseas territories how they feel about it. But obviously there, there are a couple where there are more discussions on a political mm -hmm. level about potential independence and so, many where there aren't. So should British uh, government policy be on the basis that the territories are remaining British rather than it's a transition to becoming independent because I think in the past I think FCO policy has effectively been it's a matter of time. Should we review that and actually now say that following the last territory to, to go which I think was Hong Kong uh, the remaining ones will actually stay British therefore we should reflect our policies should reflect that this is a permanent arrangement rather than something that may change in, in a few years time. I think in, since I've been involved with overseas territories, there have been three different attitudes in government, which is a legitimate uh, matter of government policy. Uh, the consistent thing is to say um, self-determination so far as possible. Uh, the variant has been self-determination, but it doesn't make a lot of sense for some of these connections to continue. We'll try and encourage you and help you to... Uh, make our own way in the world subject to consent and the seesaw sort of tipping up the other way is a matter of consent we like you, we'll try and do our best to, to keep you because we like the association and all of those I think are legitimate, they all reflect self-determination so far as that is uh, feasible with OTs 
um, and which end of the seesaw is up is a legitimate matter of policy. Mm-hmm. I mean, I would say I think there's a real need for a review of the situation that I don't think you can really bunch all the overseas territories together. I think that, you know, as I said, they're all quite unique, but there are various groupings that will have a different answer to the question uh, that you're asking. So I think there may be some, as I said, where there are discussions uh, still internally around independence, where uh, things may be quite in flux, and particularly over the next few years you might see fluctuations. Whereas there may be others where actually there is a fairly a fairly obvious answer of a, of a sort of fixed status, where the, it's very unlikely that that's going to change, or that if it changes it may be uh, towards a, a sort of greater closeness to the, to the UK rather than the opposite direction. So I think um, there needs to be a, a review of groupings, if you like, of overseas territories, that maybe bunching them all together in, in one group no longer makes sense. Do, so do you feel that it's, it's time that the UK... Uh, changed its approach to how we deal with overseas territories. To give one example, uh, they are currently uh, under the management of the the Foreign Office. Now, if they're British territories, uh, do you feel that it's appropriate that going forward the the Foreign and Commonwealth, and they're neither Commonwealth either, by the way, because they're not allowed to be members of the Commonwealth in their own right, is the FCO the appropriate department for uh, the territories going forward, or should they be more brought into domestic government departments? Well, the committee may have seen my submission on this. I'm, my personal view, and it's definitely not the policy of the United Kingdom government, um, as far as I know, uh, is that it does make more sense to bring the management of the United Kingdom government and its relations with the other British jurisdictions uh, to a greater extent into the same stable. Um, I think you would get benefits in sort of concentrating both resources, talent and careers. Uh, and I think uh, you would get away from the confusing status that we have at the moment, partly on the grounds that, that you mentioned, that administering for the Foreign and Commonwealth Office to administer British citizens, indeed to some extent to administer territories at all, um, is needs some explanation. And I think the current arrangement adds to the confusion both at this end and to some extent in territories as to uh, what the relationship is. And, and just, just to add to if I could come back to Mr Ferguson here, um, other countries with former colonies, they seem to treat them in a very different way. Um, they also don't have a, a common, we talk about the British family, but they're not part of, the, it's very clear, the territories are not part of the United Kingdom. So we don't, even, do we don't even have really a name that represents the entire British realm. Uh, do you not think it's time we had a phrase or something that absolutely encapsulated uh, all the territories with the UK as part of a British realm? In the first part of that question, I think you could envisage a much more orderly, logical and accountable relationship um, looking at France, the Dutch, the United States as possible models. Uh, most of which would involve direct represent- representation uh, to the House of Commons. And that has some benefits. It means that you could, the, the territories could call to account the relevant secretaries of state. Uh, and it addresses a bit of a democratic deficit. It's, the catch used to be that uh, no representation without taxation. Uh, if you were going to go down this track, and there are bigger disadvantages to it as well. Um, you could see in the limitation on uh, Scottish representatives voting on income tax and maybe one day Northern Ireland ones voting on corporation tax. You could say that OT representatives didn't, shouldn't have uh, a, a right to vote on money matters. But I think the really big obstacle to this sort of neat logical structure is that it would bind territories in more closely to the United Kingdom probably more than they want. And the slightly messy arrangement we've got at the moment, certainly compared with, say, the French, um, is messy, but it reflects um, the, the wishes or the, uh, the wishes of territories uh, who I think would have, you'd need to ask them direct, but I think they would have reluctance at being tied into Parliament. Bermuda in particular, Bermudians think of themselves as Bermudians, and becoming more 
um, legislatively connected with Britain, I think would cause unease. I mean, I would agree about the, the sort of question of the complexity of British constitutional relationships, and I'm from the Isle of Man, uh, so I recognise as well how strongly people can feel about their own parliament. Um, and so while feeling British, this idea of then being sort of brought more closely into an idea of what the United Kingdom is, I think would meet quite a lot of resistance in some areas, although I think possibly in some overseas territories not so much. As I said, I think it very much depends on the territories you're talking about. Having said that, I do think that the situation generally around the British constitution, if you like, is so unwieldy and complex when you look at the different layers with the overseas territories, with the crown dependencies, with the devolved uh, governments, that there is a, a sort of need generally, I suppose, for a British constitutional um, review to look at how exactly you reflect the needs and wishes and the practical arrangements that need to be made between the UK uh, and overseas territories and Crown dependencies. And I think that also um, is reflected in decisions taken by the UK that have direct effects. So I, I raised in my paper uh, the question of Brexit and people not being able to vote in the overseas territories and Crown dependencies. And while those votes might not have made much of a difference, I mean, Gibraltar did vote overwhelmingly uh, remain, uh, there will be an impact of Brexit on the, on many of the overseas territories and Crown dependencies, but they don't have a voice in that. So that kind of question about the UK taking decisions that have direct impacts on them without them having a say, I think is part of that constitutional review of exactly how that balance is, is so, met. So you think there should be some form of constitutional review as to how the overseas territories and maybe the Crown dependencies fit within the overall British family. Um, the, the Danish, of course, do allow their uh, Faroe Islands and Greenland to vote in, in the Danish parliament. Um, I think we're the only former uh, colonial power that doesn't allow our territories any say at all. Would you at least agree with my view that there should be a committee in parliament on a day-to-day -day basis that specialises in the issues relating to territories? This is the only committee that actually does it, and of course we have bigger issues to deal with, China, Russia, America, Europe, whatever it may be. Should there not be some central committee that deals with the issues on a day-to-day -day basis, at least have that for them? I'm not sure that it would be very busy. Um, uh, the day-to-day -day business is not enormous. Um, and I think it is difficult to make the relationships too tidy. Uh, or much tidier than they are. And there's a sort of equilibrium between the, um, the arguments for better accountability, <coughs> perhaps including the sort of thing that you're, you're talking about, and their reservations about getting more close, the uh, territory's reservations about getting more closely involved. And another element in that balance is um, the UK government's principal limiting concern, which is not to allow the safety catch be released that makes the UK government be liable for contingent liabilities over which it's got no control. So that those things swirling around together yeah. make it difficult to move very far. So Mr. Chairman, I, I think we, I haven't, neither of us have answered the second half of your first question about uh, uh, terminology. Uh, I've, I've been attracted by the New Zealand use where they've got, like us but fewer of them, uh, uh, associated territories of various kinds with various different relationships. Uh, the areas that come under the Queen of New Zealand, they call the realm of New Zealand. Uh, we couldn't call it the realm of the United Kingdom because the Crown Dependencies aren't, in fact, none of them are, uh, are the United Kingdom. Whether the British realm sounds a bit vague, I don't know. But it's, it's quite a striking gap that there is no term for all the bits in the world that come under the Queen of the United Kingdom? I think it should be, there should definitely be a name, but I, I don't think that it would be me, for me to decide that. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I think it, there should be consultation. This is, uh, Mr Ferguson is absolutely, there's a huge gap here, because when you talk about uh, British territories and dependencies, there isn't one name that encapsulates everything to say that is part of the British realm or whatever we call it. And I would, I would certainly agree with Mr Ferguson that maybe there should be something that encapsulates that to explain uh, to, to everybody what 
that we are responsible for all of these territories and indeed Crown dependencies. Mr. Legray, did you have a view? Yeah, well, I was just going to say, I mean, one of the, the things that I think is quite interesting in the way the, the EU more broadly deals with small islands not directly attached to the continent mm. is the difference between outermost territories and overseas countries and territories. So outermost yeah. territories are sort of within the EU, places like the Azores and, and Madeira mm -hmm. or the Canary Islands, whereas the overseas countries and territories are dealt with as being overseas. And I think there is an argument which doesn't go to the sort of the global title for all uh, British territories, but maybe for a distinction that could be made when you look at reviewing how they're treated, that I think there probably are those differences I as think, well within the overseas territories. I think De Denmark refers to it as the Danish Kingdom, but it doesn't mean the Greenland and Faroe Islands are part of Denmark, but they are part of the Danish Kingdom. So I think something along those lines would be probably the way to go. Anyway, thank you. Interesting ideas. Royston. Um, we mentioned Brexit briefly, and I'll come back to that, I think. But there have been some other things recently, not least uh, hurricanes and changes in legislation in the UK. Um, what are the, how healthy is the relationship between the UK government and the overseas territories? Um, I think it's almost fated to be difficult partly for the reasons I, I mentioned earlier, that we're in an equilibrium where there are interests um, at the UK end and variously around different OTs in, in different forms, which are really quite difficult to reconcile in a neat, tied-up parcel. Uh, and I think there will always be a degree of confusion and pushing and pulling. Um, I don't think... It, and I'm now two years away from Bermuda, I, I don't think it is um, worse than usual. I, I don't think it's necessarily bad. Uh, I think that things like the Sanctions and Anti-Money Laundering Act obviously would represent a bit of a spike in spikiness. Uh, and, and there will always be something around uh, but I don't think the relationship is, is too bad. I, mean, I would say not necessarily speaking to UK government to overseas territories, but in terms of the way the overseas territories are portrayed and perceived in, in Parliament and the media, you wouldn't really think that people, <laughs> real people, lived on them. You know, it, it, there's always this idea that they're just, you know, that they're just offshore tax havens, a sort of rock with some banks on them. And I think that is what leads to... Uh, a real degree of sort of disenfranchisement and a feeling that it's very difficult um, to engage. But I, as I say, I wouldn't necessarily say that's about UK government relations, but more about British <coughs> relations, uh, relations with, with the overseas territories. We've spoken, well, we'll speak more about Brexit. In fact, we speak of almost nothing else these days. But um, do has, what sort of strain has the Brexit vote, I mean, you alluded to it, but what sort of strain has the Brexit vote had on the overseas territories and, and, and do they feel, I mean I was in the Falklands some months ago and then we discussed you know, there about some of their unique circumstances and how Brexit might affect them. What are the, um, what are their, do they feel that their concerns are being listened to by the government stroke foreign office in this country? Um, I mean, I can't speak for all the overseas territories. I mean, I know what some of the issues are that they're facing because of it. And as you've mentioned, the Falkland Islands, it's obviously market access. For others like St. Helena, Montserrat and Tristan de Cunha, not Tristan de Cunha, sorry, um, Turks and Caicos, um, there are issues about development funding, um, which will be the kind of funding they're getting from the EU will not be capable of being replaced by official development assistance from the UK because it's sort of infrastructure type uh, funding. So there's a, there's a cut off of international funding that won't obviously be replaced from elsewhere, which is obviously a very big deal in, in a small uh, economy. And then for others, it's a question of not having the same degree of representation at the European table when you're talking about things like blacklisting. So there are very variable impacts uh, that they have. And then Gibraltar clearly is, is, is another unique uh, circumstance where they are in the EU and they will no longer be in the EU and that will have a big effect uh, on their border. Um, so I think there are 
very big impacts. Gibraltar has obviously been treated as a special case in terms of the, the Brexit negotiations and how it's being dealt with. For the others, how much of a problem it is, I think really varies very much from territory to territory. Um, I don't know how much they feel they're being listened to, but I mean, you know, as you say, people generally are talking about not much other than Brexit and whether or not you know, the, the needs of, of Pitcairn or uh, Tristan de Cunha or Turks and Caicos are going to be uh, taken into serious account in those discussions. Uh, you know, I think that's open for debate. But I mean, obviously, they're, they're talking to them. How much whatever they're saying is being reflected in negotiations, I don't know, but maybe you have more insight. And I agree with the categories that Mr. Negri has put forward that sovereignty, top cover in Brussels, market access and aid are the sort of generic ones. Uh, Gibraltar obviously has uh, a sort of portfolio of extra unique ones to itself. You asked about how territories feel they have been represented and I know you have another witness who can give more direct uh, response to that. I declare some interest in that until a year ago I was working in the Cabinet Office uh, on um, the uh, the management of Brexit for Crown dependencies and overseas territories in particular, and Gibraltar is quite a big bit of that. And I think, uh, as of a year ago, the feeling was that they they were being um, listened to. At that stage, it was largely an exercise of, of mapping to see where the impacts would be, and making sure that in as the negotiations progressed. Uh, the UK government wasn't taken by surprise by an impact on a territory or dependency. Can we move on to other areas? And you've touched on this already in response to uh, Andrew Rossendale, but there are many other government departments who are connected to the OTs in various different ways. And um, most recently, we've been talking about various treasury elements and various diffid elements and. Uh, in many ways, the Home Office uh, has very strong connections. Um, how does the FCO coordinate these relationships? I'm, I'm sorry that this is repetitive, but it varies. Um, for Bermuda, for instance, with very Devo Max, uh, the Foreign Office has really quite not very much to do with the government of Bermuda, certainly on a day to day basis. The governor is obviously the main channel for that. Um, the probably the the government department that spoke most often to counterparts in the government of Bermuda would have been the Treasury, to the Ministry of Finance. Um, there were connections between the Ministry of Defence and the Bermuda Regiment, um, and uh, sometimes events made those contacts be more frequent. Um, in other territories, there's probably a stronger connection between DFID and the island authorities than directly with the FCA, if you set aside the governor. So it's, it's quite a varied picture. Foreign Office, I think, if you've got day-to-day -day contacts between DFID and the Development Ministry in, a, in an aid-dependent territory, the Foreign Office, I don't think, would expect to get itself in between DFID and a working relationship there if it started going wrong and the FCO probably would want to get more involved. And uh, focusing then on the, the foreign, office, foreign Office's own duties, how integrated are the OTs into the Foreign Office, into the Foreign Policy of the United Kingdom? Um, you've got three territories where there are sovereignty or neighbourhood issues, uh, Falklands, Gibraltar and British Indian Ocean Territory. And in that, it's deeply integrated. Um, to some extent, those are foreign policies that those territories bring with them, so you'd expect it to be uh, connected. Um, sometimes, like with British Indian Ocean territories, it has a part to play in our strategic relationship with another country, in that case, the United States. Otherwise, I don't think it would be easy to to show how to, to show close connection between the territories and UK foreign policy. Just following up on, on that question, if I may, um, I think there's a lot of talk about Does this not highlight the the huge gap there is here? We're talking about territories which are British. 
<clears throat> yet we in this parliament and government ministers, whether it be defence, foreign affairs, DFID, DEFRA, especially DEFRA when it comes to uh, uh, protection of uh, and conservation and wildlife, um, particularly in, in the Southern Ocean, the territories in the Southern Ocean, um, even Home Office when it comes to immigration, many of the territories use the pound sterling, so currency is an issue. I know the Caribbean ones do not, but the Falklands, Gibraltar and, and several others do. There's a whole range of areas, international organisations that the UK government represent territories in. Uh, the list goes on. You, you could probably analyse it and it, it's huge actual influence uh, HMG have over things that could affect territories, even they are all self-governing. Isn't there a big gap here about how territories are included and consulted and represented? And shouldn't we try and look at this and resolve it so that we have a, a permanent way of dealing with things which properly gives territories a voice and a say over things that affect them? I think it's difficult to make that relationship between quite all departments um, and uh, territory governments very much more direct. Uh, and to go back to the Bermuda example with Devo Max, Devo Max Plus, um, DEFRA um, would find it very difficult, and I think understandably so, to influence policy within Bermuda in slightly the same way as applies uh, in respect of Scotland or, or devolved territories. Um, whether there is scope, I think the second half of, of, of the question, uh, getting <coughs> territories input into sort of broader UK policy, um, uh, where input might mean getting UK help, uh, I think there probably is more scope for that, but the Secretary of State for whatever, feels his or her responsibilities as being delivering the policies within either the UK or England. Um, it's quite difficult to get a UK department to feel the same sort of responsibility and concern, particularly when they're cut out of policy development in a devolved area. I mean, I would agree that it's quite difficult to to get people to listen in, in the UK. Like, if you're in an overseas territory and you want a Whitehall department to listen to you, I think that would be quite a, a challenge, particularly if uh, you know, you're not voting in UK elections for the start off and you're sort of in this separate uh, situation. Going back to the relations with uh, British government and overseas territories more generally, which I think also touches on your question, in relation to DFID, I think there is a problem as well there in that uh, you know, overseas territories are not the same uh, as development for international uh, you know, overseas countries. Mm. So it's a very different deal to be funding a big programme with a large consultancy firm in Nigeria for development uh, to actually supporting a small community in the South Atlantic to be sustainable uh, and to uh, to be able to sort of manage its day-to-day -day affairs. Mm -hmm. So I think as well on the international development question, um, there's a real need for a clarification as to what it means to be supporting the overseas territories that need development support, because it's not at all the same as development for developing countries, and it, and it never will be. They're, they're British mm. territories many of them are not going to be in a position to, to be standing on their own two feet with a wonderful sustainable economy um, because of their, their size and remoteness. So I think that yeah. is quite a difficult thing for DFID to deal with. So, so sorry, if I could just yeah. one quick one. Um, is it not therefore time to have one government department, whether it's its own, you have the Scottish office, the Welsh office, the Northern Ireland office, Shouldn't there be a department for all the territories of the Crown that UK government has to work with and liaise with and for each government department to coordinate through? Or should the Cabinet Office perhaps take responsibility for all of the British territories? Uh, because at the moment it's very disjointed. Uh, there is no, there's not one minister that looks after all the different issues. 
uh, and equally so I think that there is a lot of frustration in territories that they're not fully included and consulted in all the issues. Isn't it time we, we included them properly without taking power from them because they are self-governing, but isn't it high time that we gave them their own department or unit within the government which is separate from the Foreign Office which clearly has bigger priorities to deal with in today's world? I do see advantage in that. I think also going back to an earlier point on, on this exchange, the Cabinet Office would find it slightly easier to get other vital departments to pay attention to territories. It's quite a difficult thing for a small part of the Foreign Office, which otherwise doesn't do domestic policy, to, um, uh, to tap into other vital departments, which is the Cabinet Office's day-to-day -day activity. Look at it from the other way around. Does, do you think the amount of time the FCO spends, and it might be that it actually doesn't spend that much time on it, do you think the amount of time that the FCO spends looking after overseas territories is, is an efficient use of foreign and commonwealth office time, considering that it is there effectively to speak on the rest of the, to the rest of the world an hour and a half? And if it's sort of dealing with somewhere that's not really the rest of the world because it's sort of British, but you know they don't really pay tax and they don't send representatives here, but they're not foreign, is that a good use of the FCO's time and money dealing with the overseas territories? My personal, my personal view is that it's not. Okay. Uh, so to support Andrew, we should hive them off the overseas territories in, in some kind of structure which is separate from the Foreign Office. Sorry to interrupt. My personal view, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, although I think the Foreign Office has, and I started, I was Governor of Pitcairn from 2006, which is when I got involved in this business. Um, and in the period since then, the Foreign Office has invested more in terms of uh, money and people uh, and effort in the overseas territories area, but it still seems to be an odd adjunct to what the Foreign Office is increasingly and rightly focused on. So, so, so what would you do? Would you set up a little department for the overseas territories which is separate, has maybe um, people from DFID, people from the Home Office, who knows, people from the FCO, and you almost have like a, a mini government department sitting somewhere? I think it, there are different ways of doing it, but what I've suggested in, in my note is that the UK government's bit of the Cabinet Office, which already includes the Scotland Office and the Wales Office, and in slightly previous uh, shapes there, the Northern Ireland Office at one stage briefly came under the same umbrella. Um, I, they deal with constitutional issues. They deal with some constitutional relationships. Uh, I think they could quite neatly take on the UK's relationship with the Crown Dependencies and absorb the Overseas Territories Directorate of the FCO. I'm not so sure that it makes sense to take the Overseas Territories Department of, the, of DFID in because there are specialisms that DFID has with some useful cross fertilisation but I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, I think it would be useful to have a focus. I mean, having <coughs> said that, yes, the, the Foreign Office doesn't appear to be the natural fit, my understanding is that certainly within the Overseas Territories Directorate, you know, that there are people who really understand and get what the Overseas Territories are. Whether or not they're in the right place in government to transmit that, I think, is a different question. But one thing I think you do have to be careful about, about creating a, a new department, is that it doesn't just get put in a cupboard because it's just about the Overseas Territories. So I think that you have to bear that in mind while, while moving it. Yeah, can I just very briefly, um, just to Mr. Ferguson, who's, uh, the idea of <coughs> being in some sort of regional or national <coughs> construct in, in Whitehall, um, could that have the opposite effect of, of undermining the Welsh and Scottish offices in the sense that the overseas territories are something different than uh, the, the Whitehall departmental structure that's looking after Wales, Scotland and increasingly Northern Ireland? I don't think it need to do that. Um, I don't think it need to affect the Scotland Office or the Wales Office at all. But I think bringing them together under the same umbrella offers an opportunity for a career structure in which uh, understanding the difference between uh, reserve powers and devolved powers, uh, matters of self-determination, um, constitutional relationships more generally, could become a uh, a career specialism uh, and at the moment you've got um, 
people, and I don't think you want to give this up, you've got people moving in and out from the Welsh Assembly Government or the Scottish Government into those uh, offices. Uh, you've got some uh, more Whitehall-based people who specialise in constitutional stuff. Uh, you would simply make that framework bigger and create and keep more people whose chosen career path lay not exclusively but within the world of reserve and devolved powers and self-determination considerations and so on. Uh, and again, in the Foreign Office, you've, it's not quite big enough to be a career structure, so it tends to be people who do it for a few years. I can see that the argument about a civil service career structure and uh, not having a brain drain of those particular mm -hmm. specialisms, but I think there would be a real problem from a constitutional perspective as treating Wales and Scotland the same as Pitcairn or Anguilla or... But I don't think don't. they would... In, in, in terms of a Whitehall structure, I think the, the, the constitutional arguments against that would be, in my view, pretty powerful. Well, the UK, if we did it on the model I've suggested, the UK Governance uh, Directorate, or UK Governance Group, um, already deals with how UK structures are dealt with. I, I don't think that would... Uh, I'm not, I can't second-guess what would concern people. But in a practical point, in my own career, I, uh, the first part of my career I was in the Northern Ireland office. When I was Governor of Pitcairn, I was also High Commissioner to New Zealand and Samoa. I didn't find much that I'd done in my Foreign Office career all that useful for governing Pitcairn. I found quite a lot that I'd done in the Northern Ireland office in terms of understanding constitutions, police accountability, local government elections, all those sort of things, really quite useful. So I think if somebody who had, say, come in from the Scottish Government, done a couple of jobs in the Scotland office, might find it, might, might really be well equipped to take on a job in overseas territories. Can I just say, well, I mean, not on the sort of constitutional <coughs> point, but on the, the advisory role, if you like, of, of the United Kingdom and parts of the United Kingdom. I mean, I, I think on the nitty-gritty and the daily operation in a, in a small overseas territory. It may well be uh, that the, the Scottish Government, for example, has more to say than Whitehall in terms of advisory support and connections. And so I think building connections um, is a useful thing to do, but you know, without wanting to muddy constitutional waters, but just from a sort of practical perspective uh, of exchange. Whitehall's not very good at determining practicalities against politics. Yeah, but... You would never suggest that the Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland offices would go into the FCO. No. As a reverse. <laughs> Although some would want that. Can I come to you just a moment? Can I just ask that the government is understood to be uh, working on an intermediary update to its 2012 overseas territories white paper. Given what we've been talking about just now, what should go into it? It's quite hard to see some strategic change. The 1999 White Paper did some big things, like, above all, the, the extension of full UK citizenship uh, to OG citizens, especially all of them. The 2012 one, I think, found it quite difficult to come up with a big strategic thing. And I'm no longer involved, so I'm trying to to guess what you... I think you'd be quite hard-pressed to find something very strategic to change the step, given the, the balance of, um, between not wanting to bring people in, territories in beyond their comfort zone, not wanting to uh, loosen up too much on taking on contingent liability. There's not a lot of scope for big strategic change. If it took on the suggestion of um, the machinery of government changes we've been discussing, I'd be delighted, but slightly surprised. I would say that there's certainly a need to look at, at, at representation in international relations and how overseas territories are able to have their voice heard on decisions that are made internationally that, that affect them. And so I think there does certainly need to be more work done on that. Um, and the 2012 white paper spoke about um, the fact that overseas territories should 
have the same standards of human rights protections as the UK, but what that means in practice is not really fleshed out. And one of the things that I think needs to be developed more in the white paper is this question of development assistance and what that means for overseas territories um, in practice, because I think it's very important uh, not to look at human rights simply as what's on the statute book, but also what's happening in practice. So in terms of access to healthcare facilities or uh, funding for policing and, and internal security and those sorts of things. So looking at how you put into practice uh, what you've sort of said in policy uh, terms. Oh, Good. sorry, Good. one final thing. Good. Well, Good. Just to say also to iron out the, the anomalies. Um, so as uh, George Ferguson has said, in terms of British citizenship, there are still very small anomalies in British citizenship in relation to people from British overseas uh, territories. And really just ironing out all those anomalies, I think is a very important step, uh, because they may be very small things on paper, but obviously for the people concerned, they're very important. Um, we, we've got one overseas territory, Anguilla, which has a border a uh, sea border about eight miles with uh, an island which um, is part of two other European Union states. Um, the um, Saint Martin is one of the four kingdoms that make up the Netherlands and Saint Martin is a French territory. Um, I know you've answered questions already uh, relating to the Brexit issue but what is the implication for uh, Anguilla, in your view, of these changes? And specifically, isn't there an argument that places like Anguilla and uh, some of the uh, potentially other smaller overseas territories would be better to have some relationship closer to that of uh, the UK than uh, have, like the French uh, territories and the Netherlands territories in that area? I think that there are two questions wrapped up in that. I mean, on the first one, I'm not uh, uh, remotely an expert on Anguilla. Anguilla is not in the EU, so the, the, the sea border uh, that it, with its nearest neighbour is already an external border of the EU. Which I, so I don't think that's going to, to change. Um, I uh, see logical attractions in the closer relationship that uh, the French and Dutch territories have with metropolitan France and the Netherlands. But I, uh, and although I've had some hopeful conversations with various people over the years on it, I've never picked up any real enthusiasm for getting closer uh, and uh, losing the autonomous identity that, they, that they, is currently enjoyed. And Bermudians, Bermudas had sort of devolution since 1620 and were sort of a kind of American until the 1770s. Uh, they, the term Bermudian, I think, was first heard in about 1615. They're not suddenly going to call themselves British. And I'll just say, I mean, I, the, for the specifics of Anguilla, I think you'll need to speak to <laughs> the yeah, Anguillan representation. Uh, but the one thing I do think it highlights is uh, things like access to healthcare. So from my understanding in Anguilla, they, can, they will often use healthcare facilities in French uh, Saint-Martin. And if there's a risk of that uh, relationship uh, being unavailable, uh, then the question is, well, where do you go? And if you're on an island with limited healthcare facilities, and I think this is a, a big issue in terms of the UK relationship with overseas territories for many of them, is that the UK has limited the number of people who can get access to the NHS if they need it. So I think with Anguilla it's four, I'm not sure. I know some of them, it's, it's, you know, there's small numbers of people who can potentially come and get NHS treatment if they need it. But I mean, what happens if you're number five on that list and therefore you don't get access to healthcare at all uh, because there is no sufficient healthcare on the island you live on and you can't get access to the UK NHS care. And so I think that in terms of the, the closer relationship, because beyond that sort of issue of being closer to the UK, I'm not sure how in, in the context of having your borders with the European Union, you're better off being closer linked to the UK, or if you're better off 
being further distance from the UK, I'm not sure time will, will tell on that. But I think certainly on issues like health and education and those kind of things, um, there are big questions in some overseas territories, again, not all, because they've all got slightly different uh, arrangements about making sure that people do have adequate access to healthcare and ad adequate access to education when that's not available on the island they live on. Yeah, for Anguilla, they, they have to, uh, if anybody's flying, they, they go to the Queen Juliana Airport, which is uh, uh, some, uh, across the water. Yeah. Um, can, I, can I ask you, on this health issue, um, is Gibraltar in a completely different category because it's part of the European Union? I'm not exactly sure of the arrangement with Gibraltar, but I mean, they, I assume, yes, you could have your European health insurance card as you would from the UK, for example, to, to be crossing the border into, but, into but, in, but in terms of uh, people from Gibraltar coming for treatment in the UK? I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I know that there was a debate around the Crown dependencies about nine years ago to remove reciprocal health agreements, but they didn't have number limits as they do in some of the overseas territories. Do you know, happen to know on Gibraltar? I don't. I, my, my hunch, but it's a hunch which you need to check, is that the government of Gibraltar pays a sort of subscription either to an NHS trust or to the NHS um, and carries its own cost in that way. I think for Anguilla, I'm venturing onto things I, I, I'm speculating about, but it seems quite hard to expect the Dutch or the French indefinitely to pay for the more serious health costs for British territories. So whether either the government of Anguilla or the UK government pays a similar sort of subscription to them, that may happen already, uh, or maybe so under perhaps consideration. Perhaps we, we'll need to explore that with the Department of Health, amongst others. But certainly that issue was something that was raised in the WAS inquiry report on St Helena uh, and access for people with, with very serious healthcare needs to, to UK treatment in NHS trusts. Okay. Thank Can you. I ask Chris to come in? <coughs> George, you were, uh, sorry, Mr. Ferguson, um, uh, you were High Commissioner in New Zealand, I remember, because I visited you, um, but what do you think about Pitcairn? Why on earth is Pitcairn still British? Um, because informally we took on an undertaking in 1945 under Article 73 to um, maintain its, uh, its, its welfare and its development, um, because it always has been British, even if it began in slightly unorthodox circumstances. Um, uh, that, 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 I think, is 99%. But it's proved answer. historically difficult for us to tackle child abuse there. Um, we've, we've always turned to New Zealand um, justice system to be able to deliver that. They're far closer. Um, has it got any military strategic significance to us, or is it just a kind of relic of our historic past? Um, it has, I think there was a ship spotting uh, depot on it during the war. Uh, I'm not sure. Which war? The Second World War. Oh, right. I'm, I'm not sure if it spotted any ships. But, um, <laughs> uh, I couldn't identify any strategic uh, uh, benefits now. Um, the relationship with New Zealand is very, very strong. Most Pitcairners were born in New Zealand because that's where you go to get born. Uh, the police officer is a country from New Zealand police. When there's a need for prison officers, they come from New Zealand. As you say, we, although that, strictly speaking, they're members of the Pitcairn bench, um, the convenient place from which to stock the Pitcairn bench is the New Zealand bench, which has worked very well. Um, I think if there were to be any change in that, New Zealand would be the obvious um, jurisdiction to make the change with if they wanted it and above all if Pitcairn has wanted it. Uh, there are precedents that Tokelau Islands I think were transferred from UK um, supervision in the 1920s to New Zealand supervision. Um, I, the, the key thing would be um, the willingness of Pitcairn to contemplate it and the willingness of New Zealand or indeed any other jurisdiction to um, share the responsibility or take on the responsibility.
Can I ask you about corruption in the overseas territories? Because one of the allegations that is frequently made, um, both within the territories and from outside, um, when the French, you know, raise their um, objections around financial transparency in the overseas territories, they often point uh, in the UK rather they point to the overseas territories. Do you think that's a a, a fair allegation or unfair? I should probably limit my answer to Bermuda. I, I, would, I could do Pitcairn, but it has no financial services. Um, I don't think Bermuda has much to be ashamed of in terms of international transparency. Uh, it has had a um, beneficial ownership re uh, registration regime since the late 1940s, uh, which includes trusts, which is unlike a lot of other jurisdictions. Um, it has moved quite a lot in the last few years to have uh, rapid access, instantaneous access in some cases, for tax and um, law enforcement authorities in G7 countries and I think EU countries. Um, the, the gap is with the United Kingdom is on direct access to this information from everybody's laptop, which is a gap with the United Kingdom but the United Kingdom is quite a long way ahead of everyone else on that. And I think Bermuda meets uh, OECD standards pretty comfortably. Uh, and um, I think has a record that it can quite proud of in that respect. I mean, I'd say I, I'm not an expert on the details, but I think they're an easy target. So I think that often the, the scale of the criticism is, is not necessarily fair. And certainly, following um, discussions in, in the UK Parliament, you'll find parliamentarians referring to places like the Bahamas as British overseas territories. So I think there's a, often a conflation, uh, and they're quite easy targets because they're, they, it's not so easy for them to stick up for themselves. So what the reality is on the ground, uh, I suspect, is, is not proportionate to the amount of criticism uh, that they get. And I, I understand that... I, you know, there is certainly a need to deal with transparency and corruption and often that can be a challenge in small jurisdictions in general uh, to deal with and not simply on a, on a financial services level but just more, more broadly it can be a challenge in, in, small, in small... But don't some of them still have a system whereby you can only vote if you're a belonger, you can only become a belonger if you're um, appointed as a belonger by those who've been elected um, and uh, you'd have no... Um, direct taxation um, of individuals or of land and consequently you end up with a financial system which is rather biased towards making um, money off financial services rather than a more solid sustainable economic base. I can only answer for Bermuda. That, w that wouldn't be correct. It's no. not true of Bermuda. Uh, and Bermuda, um, one of the main sources of, of income is uh, land tax, another is payroll tax, ta tax on earnings. Um, uh, and shipping, but they're about to lose shipping unless they change their minds on um, same-sex marriage. Perhaps. I mean, I think that that's putting together a, a lot of issues, and I would not suggest that there aren't issues, and that there aren't human rights issues, and there aren't issues around immigration status and, the, and people's access uh, to services according to their, uh, their residential status. But I think that's quite separate from a sort of wider issue of financial services. And one thing I would say um, about the question of, of other sustainable industry is uh, I think that's a very, very big question. Um, and I can't <coughs> also see any reason why it, it's more morally correct for the City of London to be a financial centre than it is for you to have a financial centre on a small island, wherever that might be. So I think there are lots of of issues that are that are often conflated uh, and that there is a need to address the issues that you're talking about in terms of governance where uh, where they arise but that that is not necessarily the same as, as saying we need to to sort of blame the British overseas territories for the entire global problems associated with financial services and international finance just one final question. Within the Foreign Office, is it your impression that the overseas territories take up a fair amount of time, energy and 
um, paperwork compared with their significance to the United Kingdom or, or a wholly disproportionate amount? No idea. I don't have any figures for it. As I said earlier, the, the, the commitment in terms of people in cash has gone up in the last 10 years. Um, I think, as I put in my paper, it is, as the Foreign Office is rightly focused on three uh, logical priorities, it's quite hard to fit overseas territories into those priorities. So I think inevitably it becomes a bit of a clip on. Andrew, you wanted to? Yes, a couple of additional uh, points, if I may. F first of all, um, <clears throat> Mr. Bryant talked about uh, Pitt Cairn and uh, it's a, possibly a relic and, uh, and all the rest of it. But surely today we should see uh, territories as part of, of a, a global Britain network as Britain uh, alters its uh, international policies in terms of our trade and cooperation globally, with global Britain. Do you feel the overseas territories could actually play quite an important role in that British network around the world? Inside the Bermuda identity to carry out that sort of to carry that sort of weight, I rather doubt. Yeah, I guess it depends on the territory. <laughs> but to include them and to give them opportunities to take part in the work we will be doing in the years ahead in terms of promoting a global Britain strategy. Do you not feel that if we were to give territories those opportunities and make them feel part of what we're doing, do you not feel that they might respond in a very positive way and it would give them the feeling that they're equally part of the British family and where we go, they go, and our successes will also be their success? I think that there are attractions in making that offer, and um, I think um, and there are areas like participation in, in trade missions, participation in Lord Mayor's visits, and so on, where and I think some years ago there was agreement in principle that overseas territories could bid to take part in Lord Mayor's visits. Um, so far as I know, that hasn't been taken up and may now have been forgotten. Um, but I think the offer is certainly worth making in those sort of cases mm -hmm. where um, overseas territories could take advantage of the platforms of British embassies and commissions <coughs> around the world. I, I think it would be in their interest to do more of that. I think the door has been more or less open, but <laughs> either because they don't want to confuse their own image in the world as, a, as, as an autonomous uh, jurisdiction, or because they're not sure that it's available. Um, for whatever reason, I think the offer hasn't been taken up, but I think it should be renewed. I think as well it'll slightly depend on what global Britain <coughs> looks like, which is quite a, an open question, and whether or not uh, there is horrific competition, if you like, between what the UK is trying to do and what a, what, what a particular overseas territory is trying to do in, in a specific area. So it's going to depend on whether or not there is an alignment of interests and whether those interests support each other or whether there's a perception that they would be better off keeping a, a separate identity and so I think that remains to be seen but yes, yeah, so there's no reason why the offer shouldn't be there. Mm. One does somewhat get the feeling occasionally that uh, British identity is optional when it's convenient it's yeah. hung on to and when it's not it's rejected would that be fair? I think the overseas territories might not be unique in that um, <laughs> I merely identify that the talk of family can often be rather distant and cousins can uh, often reject the family name and decide to do their own thing. Uh, but, uh, I mean, Bermuda takes part, as do, uh, Bermuda takes part in the Olympics as, and quite a lot of the territories take part in Commonwealth Games. I think sport is often an area where um, the choice of identity can be slightly unexpected. Home internationals and rugby internationals is one of them. Um, may I just ask then, uh, should the OTs be full members of the Commonwealth? I don't think it's possible uh, because the Commonwealth, I think, is an association of sovereign countries. Um, I'm not sure how much it matters because some of the things that, the, as the, the, their membership of the Commonwealth comes through their 
association with the United Kingdom. Uh, in some areas, the Commonwealth, they, they do participate in the same way as a Commonwealth member, for instance, in the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, uh, which takes sub-sovereign, or whatever the technical word is, uh, uh, legislatures into account. So uh, uh, the devolved assemblies, Canadian provinces, um, British overseas territories all take part in that, and, uh, and I think the OTs get quite a lot from it. Uh, and Commonwealth agencies, uh, like the Commonwealth Law Foundation, I think, did some very useful work in Pitcairn on the Constitution. Uh, so I'm not sure they miss out much by not having their own flag at the table. A territory state or something, because at the moment uh, the Commonwealth Secretariat produce a map of the Commonwealth <coughs> and they, they don't include territories. Of course, Bermuda or any of them, if they declared independence tomorrow, would be given full status. And how much is the objection to them having any status in the Commonwealth got to do with Norfolk Island and, and Australia? Because it seems to me like they block any attempts to give territories a status because of the situation with Norfolk Island? I think it's um, this is rather on the edge of things I know about, so I'd probably better not comment further. But I, I think there is a, at the moment it's relatively simple. You have to be sovereign to be in. Mm. Once you go below sovereign, do you take provinces, do you take overseas territories, do you take crown dependencies? It's a less clear line. And I think, as you've said, that they do get involved in activities, so you know they, they benefit from British membership, if you like, of the Commonwealth. So what the additional benefit of being a full member would be, I think, is, is debatable. One thing, though, I do think uh, is worth exploring as part of a general review of the constitutional status is their ability to engage internationally in other fora. And as you mentioned earlier, the Faroe Islands, I think the Faroe Islands has got a much more developed external relations identity uh, on its own, separate from Denmark, than the British Overseas Territories do. So exploring how that works or, or similar examples could be useful. But whether it's for the Commonwealth or other international groupings, um, I think is, is debatable. Can I say thank you very much indeed. Your insights have been extremely useful. And I'm very grateful. We'll pause just for a moment as we swap witnesses. So thank you very much. Order, order. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended.